welcome friends to this afternoon session on the second day of our three day event here for Bandara, for Great Master, Azur Maharaj Baba Savan Singh Ji. Tomorrow will be the day of Bandara and I welcome all of you to this great event. It's the best and the greatest event that takes place every year in my life and therefore in yours. I'm very happy to say I <laughs> I have just come back after a lunch. You must have had the same lunch I had. It was, I think, nice, a good salad, a good entree and fruit. Did you all enjoy it? Yes. Very happy, very happy. Little expensive though. <laughs> when we have our own place, we'll cook our own food. Okay, we, we have an international group sitting here and mo many people see me. I received so many emails last night. People saw yesterday's talk in several countries of the world and that surprised me because in some countries it was after midnight, some places were strange hours, so people had turned on their computers or their Wi-Fi systems or whatever to listen to a talk being given here in Chicago, in this, uh, Chicago. So I was impressed that this is really a global event. The truth is that spiritual path is not a religion. It's, uh, it's, it is a universal message for everybody. It's open to everybody all over the world. Every human being is entitled to this spiritual path without any exception at all. No question of any race, color of the skin, the language you speak, the culture you live in, the country you live in, no question. It's open to all. I have a book sent to me, printed in another country. So I show it to my friends, can you read what it is? It's not Spanish, it's not German, it's not French. I say, we give up. The book is right with me. It's a translation of the book that was once prepared called Anatomy of Consciousness. And here is the book. We can't know what it says because the language is so unknown. Can you guess what language it is? Estonian. This book is in Estonian. Written in Estonian and printed in Estonia. So I was very pleased. I asked some Estonians to see, does they say the same thing I say in my talks? <laughs> it doesn't matter if it doesn't. Because books are not that important as personal experience. There are some things that books cannot replace. Books are good for getting information. Books are good for exciting us to know more. Books satisfy our curiosity. But they do not replace being in the presence of a perfect living master, no matter how many books you read. Therefore, books serve a limited purpose. And once they have served their purpose, and you have come on the right path at the right time, and been found by a perfect living master, books have much less value after that. Before that, yes, you can enjoy the books. And the fact that these now are being translated, right now, I understand, this book and a couple of other smaller versions are being translated into several languages, including Russian and Lithuanian and German and French and Spanish has already been prepared and Spanish is available. So, and many other languages. So it is amazing. People ask me to speak another language. I say, don't know too many languages, but if your tra translators are good, that's fine. Once a few translators came to me and said that we want to translate your talks. I said, okay. And they brought some translations. I said, I don't think I said this. They said, no, we couldn't hear your voice clearly. These are old tapes, very old tapes. They used to be those long tapes. When you opened them, they became long little 
rolls of small plastic. So those were the old tapes they were trying to make. Now the digital world is different, but I'm glad that uh, under Jonathan Rapkin's uh, guidance, there is a division in Isha working, which is now bringing those old tapes into digital format, and they are also going to be available free. By the way, all my talks, all my work, everything I do in the service of my master is totally free of charge. There will be no cost whatsoever, nor did my master ever charge. In fact, it has happened with me that my own university invited me for a talk, which was to be a paid talk, and they set the fee for the talk. In the middle, a, a person in the audience asked spiritual questions. I declined the fee for that reason, because it was including a spiritual subject. In any spiritual subject, there is absolutely no fee. Of course, I have a small pension I get for my work. I did in India. I worked here. In fact, I'm still working. I worked as a consultant to some people, some companies, and I, uh, I'm a good consultant. You know why? <laughs> I have a degree in business from Harvard University. <laughs> I show that paper, I become good. <laughs> Such a strange world. A paper counts more than what you are. <laughs> we were building a dam, and I was irrigation secretary in the government in India. And we were building the highest straight gravity dam in the world, to the Bhakna Dam. And we were hiring engineers, top engineers from the road, from the world. And we had our own chief engineers and other architects and so on, all working together with me. And I said, this would be a great project. But they said, we really have never done this before. And in spite of all our knowledge, we can't really do the best job. But why don't you hire a guy who has done these dams, the Tennessee Valley Authority in the United States, they done some other dams also. Very knowledgeable, expert. I said, what is his name? His name is Mr. Slocum. I said, hire him, if he's so good. So we hired Mr. Slocum. And I asked him, Mr. Slocum, what is your academic background? He said, I never went to school. <laughs> I said, what? Don't you have a degree in irrigation sciences and in engineering? He said, no, I just built dams. <laughs> and he was an expert knowing more than all the educated people with degrees. So it's not necessary. Sometimes an experience is more valuable than the academic learning that we have got, which is also true for the spiritual path also. You can have all the knowledge, and people give a lot of lectures. The lectures of people who learn from books have certain words, which lectures from perfect living masters don't have. And those words are maybe, Perhaps, I think so, <laughs> possibly, these words are missing from the talks of perfect living masters. You notice that, that therefore, there is a certainty about the knowledge when you know something. And when you don't know, you are speculating on it or just learning along with several possible contradictions which are not explainable, then the babies and perhaps start coming in. So. Mere learning is not enough. There was a great mystic, Muslim mystic, but he believed that a master is necessary. Unlike the traditional Muslim Islamic religion, where he did not believe. So his name was Bulle Shah. Bulle Shah was a great guy. And he has written such a blunt poetry about the spiritual path. He says, I have read the books. People keep on reading books. They get nothing out of it. They don't read themselves. They don't go within themselves to read who they are. What is the books going to do? He says, I've gone to the mosque. I've gone to the temple. I've gone to the church. I've gone everywhere where people worship. It's all hollow. They're building only. Nobody has ever tried to go to the real, real house 
of God, where God lives, which is our own human body, to go within it. And of course, people liked him. But he did something very odd one day. One day he went to the wine shop. He was not drinking alcohol at all in his life, the tea totally. But he went to the wine shop and said, I want a little bit of wine. In, the, in, in, in that currency at that time, for say a penny, two pennies, pence worth of wine. The, the guy at the shop said, the wine shop said, this will be no good, it will not even touch your tooth. You should take at least a little pint or something. He said, I don't need to drink it. I need to rub it on my moustache. So people should think I am drunk. <laughs> and then he had, amongst his disciples, there was a prostitute in the town. And she used to follow his teachings. He called that prostitute. He says, I need a favor from you today. She says, yes, sir, what can I do? Please lean on my shoulder, I'm going to walk in the streets. And he walked in the streets and with a prostitute hanging and in smelling of liquor. His followers were at asked, what has happened to Bullisha today? This is not the seer that we saw, this is not the mystic that we saw. And he went all the way in the street. Many people followed him and wondered what's happened. Many of his followers left him. That this is not the mystic we thought is. Look at this condition. And then he went back to his ashram. And there, some people who had collected around him said, Why did you do this? He said, You know, when you have some nice sweets, the flies try to come there too, and you should wave them off. That means some people are there only for curiosity. They are not real seekers. And if they go away after hearing a story like that, it's good enough for us. This is not meant for everybody. This path is meant for seekers. And those people said, Babule Shah, supposing everybody had left you. He says, it's not possible. If everybody had left you, you wouldn't be sitting here around me asking me these questions. You didn't leave me. So seekers never leave. They know masters can work in very different ways. But masters do sometimes play games. And sometimes they leave us in surprises. But that's the way they do it. So I am sh sharing these things with you. Because those of you who have been very fortunate to find perfect living masters in your lives, they will be able to understand that sometimes masters' actions which you don't understand, there is a hidden meaning in that. There is always a hidden meaning in what they do. There is always a hidden meaning in what they say. Sometimes they say very casual things, a casual remark, and you think there is just a uh, casual remark made. It may be holding the key to your future. You will see later on that was not so casual as you thought. The masters do not act like masters. They act like the disciples. They act like disciples because they are friends of the disciples. They were the very great disciple of great master, Dur Maharaj Baba Sawan Singh, a veterinary doctor whose stories you must have heard. I've told them many times. Dr. Isha Singh veterinary doctor, the guy who had to bring his father by tying him up on a cot, the guy whose son died in the river and they couldn't find the body and he had to go and ask the master. And his wife said, I want the son back. And he came back after a long time. All those stories about Dr. Isha Singh. When he was old, Isha Singh spent some time in my house. Many people told me he is more of a mystic than the masters of that time. Isha Singh told me a master is, in, in, in our language, he said, he is your first guru afterwards. He is a friend first, master afterwards. If a master is not a friend, he is not a master. Friendship is so important. To maintain that friendship, Masters have to act exactly like the disciples. Because if, if a master is so different from us, we cannot be friends. If you put a master on a pedestal and say he is oh, very different, he's not an ordinary person at all, then 
we cannot be friends. We can do other things. We can admire a person. We can adore him. We can even worship him, but cannot be friends. I'll give you an example. Supposing a master comes into this audience while we are chatting and suddenly appears to be floating in the air, showing off that he is not an ordinary person. He can fly with his human body, with the physical body. And he flies over here. We'd all be looking up at him. What would be our thoughts? Many of us will think that he must be having some strings attached somewhere. This is not, it's not possible. It's a trick, some magical trick he's doing like magicians do. And he must be doing some trick. Then, somebody, some, some people may even faint to see that he is really flying like this. Some may even say, he is a true master, we worship him. Nobody will say he is our friend. Supposing he falls down while performing this trick, and he falls down here, many of us will run to help him. And first time, we will see a sign of friendship for him. Don't forget, friendship comes for human beings with human beings. And that is why masters are not only human beings, they are ordinary human beings in their life, in their contact with us, and that is how we relate to them. And we say they are very ordinary people with extraordinary things happening around. It's very extraordinary things happen that when they say things, the way we feel about it, in their presence, the way we feel about what they say, something touches somewhere which is not our minds, but somewhere it's happening. That is because of the awareness which they carry with them. Otherwise, they are ordinary people. Great master used to give an example. He said, masters are like anybody else. And he gave example that supposing you have radio sets. In those days, we used to listen to small radio sets. He said, supposing you have 10, 20 radio sets sitting here, none of them have batteries and none of them are connected with power. Then you connect one of them, they all look the same. But only the news of the world will come from the one that is connected. He says, masters are like anybody else, but they are connected with the totality. And that's what makes them different. Otherwise, they are exactly like us. And that's how we become friends. This friendship is little different that this friendship is permanent. Most friendships in our life last for a little while. Then they go away because friendship is based upon meeting each other and when you can't meet each other, friendship goes away. The person dies, friends die, we lament, we are sad, we mourn and the friend is gone. <laughs> friendship does not last forever. This is a unique friendship that when a master becomes your friend, he is a friend forever. You will never see him unfriendly after that while he is alive and he will still be a friend even after he physically leaves the body and dies. And you will have a greater experience of the, of the master after he dies and he will be a friend the same way. He will crack jokes, he will tell stories and he will be traveling with you, he will fly with you, he will do everything. And it is an amazing friendship. That is how we realize that what kind of friendship is coming from true love. It's very different from just merely saying we are friends. I, I, I receive jokes from a friend of mine, good friend, permanent friend. He lives in Canada. He's also present here in this uh, audience. He sends me a joke every day. He says, your daily smile. He knows I remain very sad, otherwise I'm looking at the flight of the world. <laughs> so he sends me to cheer me up. And I just, it does cheer me up. Some of the jokes I can tell you, some I can't. <laughs> There's a borderline joke I can tell you later. But he sent me jokes even today. And a lot of jokes are about friends and friendships and what happens if they go in the wrong bed with somebody or something. I will not mention that. <laughs> I can uh, tell you a joke, especially on this day, Jonathan's birthday. <laughs> Many of you have heard Jonathan's joke. Some of you may not. Is there anybody who has not heard Jonathan's joke, please raise your hand. 
Oh, it's worth, it's worth repeating. Okay, this Jonathan's joke says, Jonathan's joke because I don't want to take credit for it. He told me. He said that there was a pastor of a church and he had two parrots and he trained those parrots to say oh, Hail Marys and he could say verses from the Bible. He was very nicely trained and the parrots were trained to hold beads in their paws. So they would hold beads and speak holy words. It's a very good experience and created such a great ambience, spiritual ambience in his house where the parrots were or if you took them to church, in the church. And one of the parishioners liked it so much. He said, Mr. Pastor, you have such beautiful, wonderful, these birds, these parrots, and they are saying such holy words all the time. He said, parrots are trained. You can train them to say anything. I just trained them to say these verses and say, say these words. You can go and buy the parrots, train them also. So the parishioner went to the parrot store and he bought two parrots and he brought them home. And when he opened the cage to let them out in the house, he found they were female parrots. And the female parrot said, We are hookers, you want to have a good time? <laughs> he was shocked. He said, What kind of parrots have I got? He went and told the pastor, I got some wrong parrots. He said, No, they are not wrong parrots. The parrots have been trained to say that thing by a previous owner. And therefore, they are saying those things. You can retrain them. In fact, he offered that you can take my two parrots and when they hold the beads and they will say holy words, your parrots will learn from them and they start saying the same thing. You may not have to train them. My parrots will train them. So he brought the two parrots of the pastor to his house and they were saying holy words and moving the beads in their paws and the two female parrots opened up. They said, we are hookers, you want to have a good time? And pastors, two parrots, one looked at the other, then he shouted, throw away your beads, our prayers have been answered. I want to tell you that sometimes there is a feeling in some quarters that masters are very serious people teaching a very serious subject. They can't tell jokes. Of course, on that basis, I'm pro properly disqualified. I'm disqualified <laughs> by my wife and also by that guy. Who <laughs> but I must tell you, great master was great in telling jokes. And he laughed so much, and we laughed with him on the jokes he would share with us. It's a great experience to hear the jokes from great master and to see that sense of humor is important. We have eight senses, not five. The five senses we talk of in sense perceptions, five senses are only physical senses. The sixth sense, which they say is like intuition and Women have more of it, that's how they claim. Maybe they do. Sixth sense is more important in life than the five senses. The seventh sense is even more important than the sixth. And it's called common sense. And it is very uncommon. <laughs> it's common sense is the sense to distinguish between the grain and the chaff. To distinguish what is important and what following and what is trivial. We will, if you look at your own lives, how we have not been able to distinguish between important things for us and the trivial things. We spent a lot of time on trivial things. Now, I can give an example. Many homes I visited, they have got so many little, little things gathered together. Old papers, old books, very valuable things in their garage, in their rooms, and cluttered all over. Very valuable things. They never use. They will never use. And when they die, their children will throw them away. But they think they're very valuable things. And on the other hand, they 
spend more time on the triviality than on meditation, on friendship, on love, on relationships. Less time on that and more time on collecting all those things. Can you imagine how much we collect in material, small, small things, and we store it? And then what happens? Then when we die, we miss it. Oh, I should have taken care of it. We miss these objects so much that we have to come back for it. People are reborn, re uh, reincarnated because of their attachment to these trivial things which they never use and are useless. But yet how our mind works. There was a friend of mine in Chicago. Then he moved to Las Vegas. And I said he wanted to come to every program of mine. So we were having an event and he and emailed to me, I am sorry, I could not come to your program because there is a nice chair in the furniture shop. I want to buy that and I have put in a certain amount that I was going to use for coming to see you. I put in for lay away. What is lay away? I have laid away for that chair. It's a very beautiful chair. It will cost $900 and I have put in uh, $200 or $300 as lay away. Next event happened. I sorry I could not come to see you because I had to pay the second installment of the layaway. And then he died. Can you imagine that guy is going to come back just for the chair? Because he can't help it now. I invested in the chair. I couldn't get it. And therefore, he wants to get back into the same state in order to get the chair. He will get the chair, I can tell you. <laughs> but at a big cost. So that is why we sometimes mix up the tri trivialities. That is why this seventh sense of common sense is important. That stay with, stay with the important things. Nobody in the world can do everything. We try to do many things which are beyond our capacity. But we think we can do everything. It's not possible. So select what is important do those things and leave trivialities away. There are too many trivial things around us. And especially be careful that the things you are collecting which you are not even using, they are just cause of attachments. And as Buddha said, our entire suffering in the human body, in the human life, is because of desire and attachment. Our desires and attachments are creating all our problems here. That is why take care. It, and common sense is important. But the eighth sense is even more important than common sense. <coughs> it's the sense of humor, the ability to laugh, the ability to laugh at your own situation, the ability to laugh at the show going on, the ability to laugh and postpone something that you thought was very serious and was affecting you. The ability to laugh is a big thing. The sense of humor is really a great Thing. And I've seen it in action with Great Master, Guru Maharaj Baba Saman Singh Ji. So these are things that I observed and I felt very happy that I was able to learn something. Today, I have crossed the age of 90. Nine zero, not one nine. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore, you all look like my children. Therefore, I can say anything. <laughs> Even scold you. And I get a lot of benefits. People who sent me good wishes on my 90th birthday, I wrote to them. There are many privileges I am now examining. There is a club in India that if you are over 85, they waive your membership fee. If you are over 90, even the food is free. <laughs> if I try to cross the street, so many people help me. I have to have my cane with me, of course. There is so much courtesy shown to old people, and I am enjoying my 90 years very well. But it also gives me an opportunity to share things with you, because I am not speaking as a young man who has to go through life and I am making my own conjectures, speculation, what will happen. I am telling what happened, and 
I must tell you there is little weakness also in this. One of the signs of old age is that you start telling the same stories over and over again. <laughs> and you will find this is happening. I mean, you are not in that way. My wife found it earlier than you. <laughs> that I say the same thing over and over again. And after 90, it's even more than that. But the stories I share with you is not for the sake of the story. It's for telling you the beauty of the experience that I've had with the great master, Dhul Maharaj Baba Savan Singh Ji. It's so remarkable. It affects you so deeply. And many of you sitting here, I recognize, were actually in India. Has any one of you ever felt intuitively that in your past life you were in India? Can you, can you imagine? I see lots of hands. Can any one of you imagine that you were also with great master? Wow, I am very happy to see this. I know that uh, I feel like that when I meet people, that they were there. They may be having some deja vu or something, but surely they are people, they have come back here. Why did they come back? If somebody was an initiate of great master, and I tell the story that great master, before he became a master, he got a boon from his master, that anybody who is initiated by great master need not be coming back to this life at all. Then why are these people, who could have been initiates of great master, why are they back here? They are not back here because they were forced by the law of karma to come back. They came back out of a desire to see the prophecy of great master that the axis of spirituality will be shifting to the west and localized in a big way in the United States of America. He wrote several letters, at least two or three letters were published already in, in 1937 that telling Americans, be ready. This spirituality which has existed in the East, China, India, even Middle East, is going to United States. He told Julian Johnson personally a number of times that the axis of spirituality is shifting. It's a big thing happening. And that is why these souls would come back, have come back in order to watch this transition as well as to be of service. They want to do more service to great master's cause in this country. And I recognize that too. So that is why I am very appreciative of those who came this way. I had to come to the immigration process. And you know how the immigration is more difficult to get the visa and get H1 and then green card and then citizenship. I went through all that. Look at these people, so clever, they came by reincarnation. <laughs> but I'm very happy, I'm very happy that these people are here and they are, many of them have met me and I'm so delighted that I see them. It's a beautiful experience. Well, I have uh, said a lot of things to you, both formal and informal, and I will be seeing you tomorrow for the Bandara of Great Master. It's a very special day. It's always been a special day. A special day for me, a special day for anybody who comes around for the Bandara. I see great masters showering grace. Like he's carrying a basket of goodies and just giving away to whoever wants. He used to say that uh, he carries a basket in India, in the Dera, he used to say he carries a basket of goodies, but when he goes around to give it, everybody is sleeping. Because the time he chose to go is 3 a.m. Everybody was sleeping. Very few were awake at that time. I was very lucky. I was not awake, but he had a big stick with him to wake me up. It was hot weather, and we used to sleep outside on little cots, small beds that were movable very easily. And we used to sleep on that outside. He would come at 3 o'clock, 
he was sleeping and he would say, get up, three o'clock, time for meditation. He would say, oh yes, master, and we get up suddenly, sit on the bed itself, upright in meditation. Then you watch him go away. <laughs> and he just turned the corner, oh, we are back in the bed. <laughs> but he was too clever, he came back. <laughs> And he said, I do, you'll do that. <laughs> and then he couldn't sleep after that. <laughs> These are just simple things that he did. But I'm telling you, on 2nd of April every year, I see him bringing a much bigger basket and showering the grace. That's why it's a proper word to call it the Bandara. It's the abundance of grace that you give. I'm very happy you're here for tomorrow. And I'll see you tomorrow. And thank you very much for participating in this Bandara with me. Thank you very much for permitting me to tell these kind of jokes like Jonathan's joke. <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much.